How can manufacturers adjust to the digital world? That's the subject of my conversation today with Vanessa Oktar. She is a principal with Cotter, the management consultancy specializing in strategy execution and change management. Vanessa, welcome. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. I want to run down a few things that manufacturers ought to be doing in your estimation in this so-called increasingly digital world. So let's start with this idea of how can manufacturers arm employees with the right tools to stay ahead of the automation curve? Yes, that's a great question. As manufacturers think about how they arm their employees to stay ahead of the automation curve, I think right now there's a lot of anxiety that employees are feeling around what Mm -hmm. that means, what that looks like, what does that mean for my job, do I have to learn new things? Am I going to be capable of what that means in terms of working in a digital world? So really thinking about how you can bring them along from the very beginning so that they feel like they're a part of the change that's coming rather than sort of waiting for, for this doomsday that they may have imagined in their, in their minds. Mm-hmm. Um, really thinking about how you can bring them along from the beginning, knowing that the employees that you have probably have a lot of ideas around what they would hope to get out of a new digital solution. So really hearing their voices from the very beginning, I think, is one of the critical components. And we're going to be driving, delving into that a little bit more, some issues of training and the like to help them assure, you know, assure these employees that they'll continue to be employed, assuming that they will. Uh, but yes. we're, going to, we're going to have that assumption uh, as a basis of our conversation right now. What does it mean to reskill backwards? Yeah, when you think about reskilling backwards, too often we see when organizations think about a digital transformation or taking their manufacturing line to be more kind of fitting in the automated world, they start with this notion that we have to change digitally, so let's find a tool. Rather than starting with the end in mind and saying, what are we trying to accomplish by bringing in new technology and by digitizing the way that we work? So really thinking about what are we hoping to get out of it? How is our business going to look different? And why does that matter? Why does it matter to our employees? Why does it matter to our customers? What are we going to be able to accomplish? And starting with that end vision in mind, and then working backwards to say, what's the right digital tool or tools to help us achieve that? And what are the skills that we need from our employees to be able to help achieve that? Rather than just thinking about, I need to catch up because competitors are digitizing and then Mm -hmm. you sort of still end up behind the curve. So these determinations that you're talking about, they occur before the purchase of the selection of the automation is even made, you're saying, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Then then you go forward based on that. And are you involving the workers at that early stage? I mean, you have to make some sort of determination Mm -hmm. as to their fate before you even talk to them, but how early are they being brought into the decision before the automation is even selected and acquired? I would say the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. Um, Your frontline workers are the best ones to tell you what they need to do their job better. They'll tell you what's going to make their job easier. They'll tell you the workarounds that they've figured out that take too much time. So really getting their voices in from the beginning and getting their perspective is only going to help you. And then when you bring a new digital tool in, you already have some people who are primed for it, who are more bought in because they've been part of developing that solution. So it's going to move you ahead more quickly and get you ahead of some of the resistance that we know everybody faces when implementing change. But to be honest, automation does displace some workers. I mean, it's widely accepted that it doesn't destroy human employment altogether, but it does require fewer people on the floor. That determination has to be made at some point. So how do you deal with that? I mean, certain employees aren't going to be with you anymore and certain ones are. Do you like make that that revelation very early on or does that not come until the automation is in place and you understand how it's going to affect your workforce? Where does that decision come and how do you communicate that to your workforce? Absolutely. As leaders think about how they're communicating to their workforce, we really recommend as much transparency as is possible. Obviously, there are limitations to that. There are certain things that you don't have answers to or things that for legal reasons you can't quite disclose yet. But workers are going to be feeling anxiety. They're going to be making assumptions about what's coming. I think all workers in the manufacturing space know that automation is only going to increase. And so they're already thinking about it. They already know this is a potential reality. If you can be transparent with them up front, then that's going to quell a lot of that anxiety that they're feeling and hopefully mitigate some of the resistance and some of the pushback that you're going to get, which on the flip side is only going to help your reputation as a business, right? So the workers that are leaving the organization are going to go out and they're going to be talking to their friends, to their family, to their peers. 
and you want them to leave feeling like they were taken care of by the organization, even if that means they weren't able to maintain their job. And so it's only going to be helpful if you can really share that with them as early as possible. Okay, we've talked about backwards reskilling. Let's talk about upskilling now. And especially from mm-hmm. the standpoint of meeting immediate needs, you've got to move fast when you bring these machines in. You don't have a lot of time to adjust. So how do you upskill mm-hmm. the existing employees in a, an efficient manner that brings them up to speed on, on the system? Absolutely. So really one of the fastest ways to bring people up to speed on the system is to tap into the energy of the employee base. So finding people who are ready to jump in, excited about change, who have influence with their peers. So who are the people that folks go to to ask questions? A lot of times that's more veteran employees or it's, you know, certain people that just have natural leadership capabilities. So how do you really leverage that informal leadership? Get them on board quickly so that they can help train their peers, answer questions. So you're not solely relying on technology consultants or whoever's training you on the specific solution that you're using. Mm -hmm. You really need to expand that base of people that can help you with that training. There are, of course, generational issues. It's the, almost a cliche that the younger you are, the more willing you are to accept change, especially automation-wise. How do you begin to address, you were talking about some of your veteran people on the factory floor who may be pushing back mm-hmm. against the whole concept whatsoever. How do you deal with that generational change? Absolutely. When you think about generational change, I think we so often assume that older generations of employees are automatically going to be resistant to technology. And that's just not the case. We've seen over and over again in the work that we do, when we really tap on the shoulders of veteran employees, the number of times they say, I've had an idea of how to fix this for 25 years and no one has ever asked me before. Hmm. Or I'm really excited because I know that there's this thing that takes me an hour that could take me 10 minutes and I waste so much time, but people assume that I'm not gonna be able to pick up the technology or that I don't want to learn it. So really actually I think shifting the mindset of how we think about our, our veteran employees and then thinking about how you can use sort of the older generation of employees and the younger generations of employees to help each other right? Those that have been in the business for a long time have historical knowledge that's incredibly valuable. They Mm -hmm. understand where the business has been. They understand what customers want. They've created workarounds for the things that don't work well for them every day. And then you have some kind of infused new energy from new new employees in the younger generation of the workforce that can really help each other kind of fill the gaps that the other doesn't have. One of the bits of conventional wisdom about the replacement of human workers by machines is that some of those workers can be reskilled or upskilled into jobs completely different from what they were doing before. They're not even on the factory floor anymore, or else they are tending the machines. They're gaining a whole new level of technological savvy. How realistic is that, that you could take people who were working as humans on a basically analog production line Mm -hmm. and turn them into like tech tech geniuses or tech experts. Does that happen? It definitely does happen. I would say it's not going to happen for everybody. And I wouldn't actually encourage organizations to think about making everybody a tech expert. Really what we would say you should invest in more than anything is building skills around change and adaptability. We know what the world looks like today, but I think especially in the midst of the pandemic, this has been made so clear for us. We have no idea what next week looks like. We don't know what is going to come three, six, 12 months down the line. So really equipping employees in a way where they can be adaptable and flexible to change, that's going to be the skill set that serves you today and well into the future so that whatever that next change is, whatever that next technology is, the employee base is ready for that and ready to learn quickly. One of the issues involved in the transition to automation is that it can create gaps in your workforce, and so can the mm-hmm. everyday reality of manufacturing with your peaks and valleys of production depending on demand during a t- certain time of the year. How then do you deal with these gaps? I mean, up to this point, a lot of employees on the production line have, been learned, have learned to do one thing. You can't shift them around to somewhere else <laughs> to fill a gap. Is it important to increase their knowledge of the system? Is that one way of doing it? And what are some other ways also of filling in these gaps that occur from time to time in a manufacturing environment today? Yeah, and I think we can anticipate more of these gaps will happen. There's so Mm -hmm. many organizations that have pivoted to producing PPE, for example, where the demand of other products has gone way down. When we come out of the other side of the pandemic, they're going to have to be ready for that 
that shift in terms of demand and what they need to be producing. So we're going to see a lot more of those gaps, I think, as we look into, yeah. the, into the near future. And really, there's huge value actually in finding places for people to play there outside of their expertise. You have a lot of energy and passion from this employee base. And I think right now people are really grateful to continue to have a job and want to, to to contribute to organizations that are taking care of them right mm -hmm. now. So use that to your benefit. And sometimes even just having somebody who can ask quote unquote, the naive question can break people out of the way that they've been thinking about things. So kind of putting them into a function that they don't normally sit in or having them do something they don't normally do can help the rest of the team that is an expert in that space, innovate and think differently and think more creatively just by getting yeah. a new point of view. Certainly keeps the job from being boring, doesn't it? I can't help but mentioning you brought it up, but we can't, we can't avoid this elephant in the room and that is the pandemic mm -hmm. and the need for manufacturing facilities to redesign themselves to allow for yeah. social distancing in an environment that otherwise sometimes involve people working shoulder to shoulder. Is that possible to maintain productivity and production levels in today's modern factories, taking into account these needs to protect the health of your workers in a pandemic and going forward beyond that? Yes. I think we have seen in manufacturing and supply chain over the years that things tend to look the same and operate the same because people assume, well, it's worked in the past, it will still work today. Mm -hmm. And I've never taken the time to question how do we redesign the flow or the layout. Um, but we've worked with a variety of organizations in the past that have done this really well, asking people on the floor, how can we make this safer? How might we redesign the flow of the work that can continue or actually increase productivity? So we've seen it with um, beauty manufacturers, we've seen it, you know, train car manufacturers kind of all up and down the board, really asking workers, what's the flow that's critical and what are the things that aren't necessarily critical that could be done in a different order or that may actually benefit from being done in a different order. And yeah. usually they'll have a response that'll help you think through that. Some great guidance and insights on how manufacturers can get in line with today's digital world as well as the pandemic and the changes that are underway and what's happening to workers. Vanessa Akhtar of Cotter, I want to thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks very much for being with me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.